Welcome back to Face the Nation. We continue our conversation now with the head of the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank, Mary Daly. Um, in that jobs number on Friday, we also saw that wages rose, but they're not rising as quickly as inflation is. How concerned are you that that shows inflation is really becoming embedded in the economy in a way that is really going to force your, your colleagues at the Fed to continue to have to hike rates? You know, I don't see inflation as embedded in the economy, the kinds of things that we would worry about just not being able to correct easily. What I see is supply and demand are just unbalanced. About 50 percent, by my own staff's estimates, of the excess inflation we see is related to demand, the other 50 percent to supply. The Fed is really well positioned to bring demand down, and we already see the cooling forming in the housing market, in investment. So I do see signs that the economy is cooling. It just is going to take some time for the interest rate adjustments we've made to work their way through. And we are far from done yet. That's the, the promise to the American people. We are far from done. We're committed to bringing inflation down, and we'll continue to work until that job is fully done. So it would still be appropriate to raise rates in September by half a percent? Absolutely. And, you know, we need to be data dependent. It could, we need to leave our minds open. We have two more inflation reports coming out, another jobs report. We continue to collect all the information from the context we talked to to see how this is working its way through the economy. But you mentioned, you know, wage growth a little bit above 5%, inflation last print at 9.1%. Americans are losing ground every day, so the focus has to be on bringing inflation down. One of the things the Fed can't control is geopolitical risk. How concerned are you about what is happening uh, in the Taiwan Strait right now? Well, there's so much going on globally, and I think that's really something that we need to think about. It's just getting through COVID, making sure the new variants don't derail economic activity. We have central banks across the globe raising interest rates to try to bridle their own inflation. And we have ongoing developments that take place, you know, geopolitically or just more generally uh, among countries. And all of those things, the war in Ukraine, all of those things create headwinds, if you will, for the U.S. economy. And we're going to have to lean against those headwinds for growth while we bridle inflation. Fed has its work cut out, and I know we'll be talking again. Thank you very much, Mary Daly. China Thank launched you. its most dramatic show of military force in decades, with four days of war games off the coast of Taiwan, all in response to Speaker Pelosi leading a congressional delegation to the self-governed island last week. Congressman Gregory Meeks, chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, was on that trip. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you. Well, you have been globe trotting, but I imagine you'll soon be back in Washington to vote on this big spending bill. It is a big win, potentially, but it's a tenth of the size of the president's original ask. Is what's about to pass and this reduction in gas prices enough to help Democrats win in November? There's no question this is a big and important bill. It reduces inflation. It makes sure that uh, we can now reduce drug prices. It helps on fighting climate change. Uh, and, and we will be moving forward. That goes on top of wins already made in a bipartisan manner during this Congress, like bipartisan wins in infrastructure, gun control, CHIPS and Science Act, PAC Act for the veterans, uh, select a uh, committee, the first black woman elected uh, of appointed to be the Supreme Court. So yes, this is uh, a icing on the cake of moving forward of democratic achievements in a bipartisan way in this election year. But despite all of what you just laid out, I, I know you know that many polls, including those from CBS, project that Republicans will win the majority in the House. Can you reverse that? Oh, absolutely. I think that the conversations as we're entering uh, the crucial months of September and October, look, we had an all-time low on unemployment rate. And we see a court that is regressive and trying to take away a woman's right to choose. We're fighting and standing for that. To your trip to Taiwan, we have seen these dramatic Chinese war games in response to this visit. China cut off some of the diplomatic ties with the United States to protest the fact that you went there to Taipei with Speaker Pelosi. 
did this trip backfire by undermining some of the Biden administration priorities? Not at all. You know, clearly uh, the Biden administration, by his presence there and by increasing economic uh, ties there, is something that shows that the region is very important. Uh, and President Biden understands, being a prior, prior member of the Senate, the, you know, the difference between the executive branch and the legislative branch. And so what we have to do at this time, because there's very clearly, it's very clearly a tense moment on the Taiwan Strait, and that's why it's very important uh, that all sides respect the status quo, which we did when we were there, and don't resort to force or to change things. And it's just as important that the United States redouble our economic, cultural, and security cooperation with Taiwan in face of Beijing's aggression. So this was a very appropriate trip at the time for the region. And I think that when we talked to the Taiwanese, they were appreciative of us being there. You should have seen over 250,000 Taiwanese tracked our flight flying in. On the largest building in Taiwan, big sign saying, we love you, Nancy Pelosi. Mm -hmm. People lining the streets uh, when we were driving to our hotel. So clearly the Taiwanese were very happy. No and doubt. let me tell you, we were all of our allies, all of our partners and friends in the region and the other nations that we visited was very happy that we were there. But Beijing, so was, fur very Beijing was furious. They cut off climate change talks with the United States. They've cut other cooperation. Um, and in fact, Beijing said this is the one issue that the U.S. and China, the two most powerful countries in the world, could come into conflict with. Beijing said a visit by the third highest ranking official in the U.S. government on a military aircraft was provocative and sends a strong signal the U.S. is on Taiwan's side. Is the U.S. on Taiwan's we side? We did nothing that was, if you look at provocative, the ones that were sending missiles over Taiwan and, and, and trying to encircle uh, the island was, in fact, Beijing. This was nothing unusual. Members of Congress this year have traveled to uh, Taiwan right. previously. I've traveled to Taiwan a number of times. I've traveled to China. But we're not going to allow, and Speaker Pelosi is absolutely all right about this, that to have... Uh, President Xi dictate to us where we should or should not go. We are going to stand by our friends, our partners, and our allies, and clearly Taiwan is one of those. And so the pro provoc being provocative is not us, it's the Beijing government, and we're just not going to allow that to happen. But in terms of this policy for decades, it's been one of strategic ambiguity. The U.S. sells arms to Taiwan but doesn't promise to actually defend it. Do you need to change that? Does Congress need to prepare for a Chinese invasion of Taiwan? Look, what we have done, and I think that what we have shown we will do, is to give, and we have given, in that policy, defensive weapons to Taiwan. Ultimately, this should be decided by people sitting down and not China and not Beijing and not Xi continue his provocative actions. It is his provocative actions that is trying to right. change the status quo. What we need at this time is the status quo to remain as is. And that is the best way to reduce tensions, not the provocations that are being put on by Beijing. Congressman Meeks, thank you for your time this morning. We'll be right back. On Friday, I sat down with Taiwan's representative to the U.S., Xiao B. Kim, for the CBS Evening News. Here's more of our interview. President Biden indicated the military uh, wasn't uh, enthusiastic about Speaker Pelosi visiting. She spoke openly about the risk of her plane being shot down. Did Taiwan ever have that level of concern that there was a risk here? We have been living under the threat uh, from China for decades. Um, and we cannot let their ongoing threats define our desire to make friends internationally. Um, if you have a kid being bullied at school, you don't say you don't go to school. Uh, you try to find a way to deal with the bully. And um, that's exactly what Taiwan is doing, uh, working on making our society stronger and more resilient, fortifying our defenses uh, so that we have means of managing risks. Um, the risks are not posed by Taiwan, nor are they posed by the United States. The risks are posed by Beijing. What specifically is that risk? Is it a full-scale invasion? 
Well, the Chinese have not renounced uh, the use of force. Uh, they have been intensifying threats uh, towards Taiwan. Uh, that is not only on a military level, it has involved a hybrid toolkit of uh, public disinformation, uh, cyber attacks, economic coercion. Uh, they have a broad toolkit that we have become more and more accustomed to. But again, that is not going to um, change our determination to defend our freedom. But what's happening right now is unprecedented. Uh, Beijing has sent 68 warplanes, 13 warships right off your coast. Do you believe that this is just a drill? Well, indeed, China's behavior is unprecedented. And from the scope and the actions, uh, it appears that they have been preparing for this for some time, uh, way before Speaker Pelosi decided to visit Taiwan. China is seemingly showing that it can blockade Taiwan, that can, it can cut you off from the rest of the world. What is the cost of doing something like that? Well, China has been building uh, up their military capacities uh, rapidly uh, over recent years. Um, and what they are doing through these exercises uh, has the potential of jeopardizing some of the most important uh, air and sea commercial routes. I believe uh, they will also jeopardize China's uh, interest in a stable environment under which trade and commerce can function. Such risky and dangerous behavior has implications for the world. Do you have any assurances from the Biden White House that they would defend you, not just sell you weapons, as presidents have for the past 40 mm -hmm. years, but actually come to your defense? We have a very strong security partnership that ensures the protection of our shared interests in the regional peace and stability. Do you believe the timeline for an invasion is moving up? The criticism of what Speaker Pelosi did by visiting is that she is provoking China. Well, I think the word provocation has only one place, and that's with China right now. Uh, they are the ones that are provoking regional instability. So you do not think that this was a mistake and that this visit has backfired? Well, the visit um, has been welcomed by the Taiwanese people. Um, sometimes it's hard for other countries from afar to fully understand the feelings and perspectives of the Taiwanese people, and that is uh, for too long, you know, we have been bullied, isolated, and suppressed, and banned from international organizations. So when friends come from afar and wish to lend their support to Taiwan, uh, we generally take that with gratitude. When you talk to Biden administration officials, mm -hmm. they will say, Xi Jinping, the president of China, is taking notes. He is watching what Vladimir Putin is doing right now in Ukraine as a test case to see what he can get away with in Taiwan. What lesson do you think he's learning right now? I think we are all learning lessons, and um, the Taiwanese people are also learning lessons. And uh, we are learning that we have to be better prepared. Uh, we have to be stronger in our own uh, self-defenses. Uh, we have to work um, hard to galvanize uh, international support in working to deter that tragic scenario from ever happening. Are you concerned that the West won't stand by Taiwan the way it has stood by Ukraine? China is financially so powerful. It would be hard for the West to cut it off. Well, I think um, that was one of the messages that Speaker Pelosi was trying to convey. And uh, that is, um, you know, despite all challenges, um, we have friends in the international community who will stand with us. Mm -hmm. And lastly, China has also flexed its diplomatic muscles. It cut off a number of agreements, it says, with the United mm -hmm. States because of this visit, including collaboration on climate change. Are you concerned that the West will look at this and say, it's not worth it, not just on climate change, but on other priorities that outrank Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Well, um, are, are we concerned? Yes, we are concerned about uh, the disruption of these very important discussions on global issues um, that are uh, matters of interest to not only the United States, but to China and everyone in the world. Um, but the fact is, again, uh, visits 
congressional visits to Taiwan have been ongoing for decades. Um, and for decades, it hasn't present, prevented the United States and China from having constructive discussions on matters of mutual interest. And um, I agree with you know, some of the US White House and other statements and the analyses that um, you know, the Beijing government is currently trying to manufacture a crisis um, over um, a practice that has been ongoing for decades. And uh, they are using this as a pretext. Um, and I, I think we have to make that clear. Um, if China is to evolve um, as a responsible stakeholder in the global community, it's really up to Beijing to decide if their rejuvenation, if China's rejuvenation will evolve with international respect or with international condemnation. Our full conversation is on our website and YouTube channel. We'll be back in a moment. Michigan Congressman Peter Meyer is one of 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach former President Trump following the attack on the Capitol. Last Tuesday, he lost his primary race against a Trump-endorsed challenger. Congressman Meyer is with us this morning from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Good morning to you, Congressman. Um, the person who won that primary is an election denier named John Gibbs, and he is backed by former President Trump. Why do you think Michigan Republicans favored him? Well, good morning, Margaret. Um, and as you said, I lost my primary, and that is on me. I take responsibility for that. Uh, but it's important to note that it wasn't just former President Trump who was in this race. Uh, there was about a half million dollars that the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee in their first expenditures of the 2022 midterms dumped in to help boost him. So we had a scenario where not only did I have the former president aligned against me, uh, but in a rare showing of bipartisan unity, Nancy Pelosi and the House Democratic Campaign Committee also united to try to knock me off the ballot. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this just highlights the cynicism and hypocrisy of our politics today. And frankly, it'll be unknowable what that ultimate impact was. But the fact that we have the establishment yeah. left and the extreme right locking arms in common cause uh, paints a very telling picture of where our politics are in 2022. Right. What you're talking about there is um, a, an ad that the Democratic Congressional Committee campaign spent uh, $325 hundred thousand dollars on to boost Mr. Gibbs, um, which was almost as much as Gibbs spent on his entire campaign. That's what you're referring to. That's what our viewers are looking at right there. But do you think that ad really made a difference? I mean, Democrats aren't voting in this primary. It's Republicans. Why did Michigan Republicans fall for this ad? Well, you know, I think there is a, a clear question of, of agency here, of course. And at the end of the day, Republican voters are going to cast their votes as they see fit. Um, I should note that this ad was not aimed at, uh, was not playing on MSNBC. It was not playing in places where Democratic voters might see it. It was yeah. targeted in places to try to sway and convince Republican primary voters to try to give my primary challenger a boost up and over. Uh, and I should add that uh, my defeat was by roughly 3% out of over 100,000 votes cast. We lost by less than 4,000 votes. And I think that's important to remember uh, when you have very close elections like this. And obviously competing against very strong headwinds, uh, having a, a Trump endorsed challenger in a party where President Trump still holds over 75% approval, uh, that a message of focusing on the substance of what I've been able to accomplish in office. I'm proud that our office is on track to set a record for the most number of bills signed into law by a freshman, uh, that those type of accomplishments uh, get lost in our current personality politics, get lost in a broader sense. And I think that is one of the fundamental challenges that we have as a country, and that so, is, uh, frankly, frustrating Michigan families, yeah. that we are dealing with a politics that does not reward substance, that does not reward you know, reality, but, but that, that focuses mean, on rhetoric and personality above all else. Do you think Democrats are going to get what they paid for here, right? I mean, they're betting that it would be easier to defeat um, Mr. Gibbs than you. Is your district going to go to a Democrat? 
Yeah, it's important to note this is a district that uh, President Biden won in 2020 by roughly nine points. I was one of five Republicans running for re-election in seats where the where President Biden won in the 2020 elections by eight or more points. And so, mm -hmm. uh, while I think there is certainly a cynical calculus at play with the Democrats meddling, uh, this is a risky strategy. It's a dangerous strategy. Where President Biden is in his approval is so in the gutter that it is hard to see that strategy. Yeah. It is easy to see that strategy backfiring in a spectacular way, which is all the more reason why we should not be embracing the zero-sum idea of politics. We should not be embracing this, this notion that if we can yeah. keep a problem alive, keep it festering, uh, but be able to gain a marginal advantage in the process, that that somehow equates to a victory. I think it's a dark and cynical way of viewing our politics mm -hmm. uh, that, frankly, 48 percent of the electorate in the primary here rejected. Uh, you, they, they stood against that cynicism, that they were focused on yeah. somebody who was working to deliver results. Uh, your Republican colleague, Liz Cheney, is about to face a primary August the 16th in her state. Um, former Vice President Dick Cheney, her father, released this video. In our nation's 246-year history, there has never been an individual who was a greater threat to our republic than Donald Trump. He tried to steal the last election using lies and violence to keep himself in power after the voters had rejected him. He is a coward. A real man wouldn't lie to his supporters. He lost his election and he lost big. I know it, he knows it, and deep down, I think most Republicans know it. Is Mr. Cheney right there? Because 57% of Republicans told CBS News they're more likely to vote for a candidate who gets an endorsement from the former president. Is the former president the leader of the Republican Party or the biggest threat to our nation's republic? Well, I, I certainly think that uh, you know, President Trump wants to keep those numbers up. He wants that degree of influence. And, and I mentioned earlier the common cause between the extremes on the right and the establishment left. Um, you know, Nancy Pelosi, I think she's waking up every day crossing her fingers that Donald Trump runs in 2024 that he announces well ahead of the midterms because right now the midterms are set yeah. to be a referendum on President Biden's leadership. And Speaker Pelosi and many of my House mm -hmm. Democratic colleagues do not want that. They want it to be a referendum on former President Trump. Right. And I think former President Trump wants that as well. Well, um, we will be watching that primary. And uh, Congressman, thank you for joining us today. We'll be right back. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.